Okay, yes. It's a small crew. Uh, we're being recorded, but who knows if these things get watched. So just, it's very um, low key. So what I did was I took a presentation that I've done for years. Um, I did it first with Beth Bernhardt um, for an ALA uh, presentation. And uh, I do it for a webinar series nationally. And I'm usually working with, with librarians from all fields. It is not usually at all instruction focused. Um, it actually usually, usually is collection focused. Um, so I am going to focus mostly on that today. But um, again, we're an intimate group. If y'all have questions about um, presentations, I have links in here to that. I have links to a lot of tools that we're going to go over at the end. Um, and this webinar, I've adapted it that, um, you know, I used to have to do it a lot in um, one of the ones where it wouldn't let me show websites, you know, like I had to stay on the PowerPoint. It had to be a PowerPoint. Um, and so I have a lot of screenshots. So, but we have time. And again, it's a small group where if you want me to go out into the website and talk about a particular project, um, let me know. And um, if people from technical services, um, more of them end up coming in too. Again, this is very collection focused. So if people have like uh, comments or additions, like let me know. Um, this is something that I did show to Kate Hill um, at one point when uh, Kate Hill uh, was still with us, uh, if y'all remember our past uh, e-resources librarian. So I think Rachel does know, does remember her. So um, here's a go link. Uh, uh, and I will also um, throw it in the chat. I feel like it should work. Um, and uh, y'all can follow along if you want um, as well, because um, it also is a um, has a lot of links in it. So if you're the kind of person who wants to, um, you know, go out and look around while I'm presenting. That is totally fine. Again, we're a small group. So um, again, I'm not going to focus on this, but in case uh, it is more presentable and more, more accessible in presentations to provide a go link at the beginning um, so that people with different um, learning preferences uh, can, again, maybe read while you're going. They can click out. They can see things uh, differently. It could work on their screen reader in a different way. Uh, so that is a question I sometimes get, whether to put a Go link or to add it at the beginning of the end. The beginning is the uh, most accessible thing to do. If you have things that you don't want to like be kind of ruined by that, um, I would just tell people that at the beginning, right, is that I will provide a link, uh, but follow along with me for now. And if you do that, it is kind of nice to be able to throw in links as you go in the chat, if you have like a co-presenter or a moderator or stuff like that. So let's just start at the beginning. Let's start at the very beginning of accessibility, where I'm going to talk about ADA compliance. Um, so accessibility is not just important, uh, it's the law. So under this federal law, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and Titles 1 and 2 of the Americans with Disability Act, ADA, uh, these are mandates for the university's effort to provide electronic accessibility to persons with disabilities. Um, so uh, you probably heard about this, universities can um, be sued by patrons, um, by students. Uh, so that is how they do this through um, ADA compliance. So um, beyond just the law, which of course is important, uh, but also thinking about our patrons um, and the populations that we serve, um, I like to throw statistics into these presentations to talk about that. So disabilities are not always what you would think. So a lot of times when I present on accessibility, I'll have someone tell me, well, yeah, I've worked with a blind student and yeah, I've worked with an audio impaired student or things like that. Um, disabilities actually, if you go out to this link, it is a link to the um, National Center for Education Statistics on students with disabilities. And the largest number um, statistic wise um, that they find are um, other things that you would think of besides physical uh, abilities. So uh, again, um, visual impairments is on there, but uh, autism is a very large one, different forms of autism. Um, intellectual disability is a very large one. Um, intellectual differences, I think, is the better way to say this. This is probably an older website, um, you know, and things like that. So um, again, all disabilities. So and then even in the other category, right, that is actually the largest. 
Um, so again, um, thinking through accessibility in a holistic way is important in that way. So um, of course, too, um, accessibility isn't just, again, learning how to kind of adapt your teaching style. It's also about this online world. Um, the first time I did this presentation was about three years ago, and what a different world it was. But then um, it was over 42% of American college students take at least one online class. Um, as you, I, I don't, who knows what that number is. I mean, you know, just the way the world works right now, I would say that number has to be what, like 90? Um, I mean, why don't at least all universities are offering more, you know, things online. So also this rise in the idea of non-traditional students, which of course you can also look up um, the definition of that. Um, the NCES is usually what I use uh, as their uh, definition on non-traditional either undergraduate or graduate students. But really what we're talking about here are working adults. It's really any student who is kind of out of the definition of this idea of an 18 to 22 year old student who is reliant upon um, some kind of caregiver or parent for financial support, right? So there are a lot of times working adults, veterans, um, transfer students, uh, caregivers, uh, things like that. So there is a rise in that and it is a population that we at UNCG and again, um, universities across the world care deeply about, um, not just based on our numbers, based on our um, strategic planning and mission statements. So um, another thing to keep in mind with accessibility and the patrons we serve is that just a quarter of students who receive help for their disabilities in high school acknowledge to their university or college that they need the same assistance. Um, so that means only around 17% of college students are reporting their disabilities. So that means that even if your university tells you that like 5% of the population has some kind of disability, right, that's what they're only saying what has been claimed through the Office of accessibility, when really we know, uh, based on national statistics, that there is a whole, uh, there's a lot of students out there who are just not telling us that they that they uh, have a uh, disability or different uh, differing abilities. A lot of that is to do with that a lot of students, again, particularly in this realm of uh, mental differences, don't think they can report it. They don't think they can receive help from their university. They think they're in it alone. Um, so that's another part of that statistic. Um, so when we talk about accessibility in terms of our um, web presence, right, our virtual presence, um, out of ADA compliance, out of statistics, out of all these things, um, something formed called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, so they were developed through the W3C process in cooperation with individuals and organizations around the world with the goal of providing a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of individuals, organizations, and governments internationally. Um, so it's been around for a while now, but we are on version um, WCAG 2.1. And there is a link out here that um, takes you into the standards and guidelines from the Web Accessibility Initiative W3C um, if you want to learn more about that. But we're going to go through kind of how it works in a second. Um, but is anyone, if anyone is familiar with standards in your field of work, uh, this should be actually pretty like easy to use. They have kind of a getting started. They have the different versions on here. Uh, 2.1 is not that different from 2.0. Um, so if you've heard it 2.0 being said before, um, that is the deal. And I guess here they're even working on a 2.2. So get ready. Um, but uh, you can use the quick reference and kind of go into the different parts of it, um, depending on what you need. Because what they do is they go over different elements of web pages, anything that lives online, and go through the different things that you need to do to make it ac accessible in all these different ways. So here is a screenshot of how it looks when you uh, go into it, um, what version you're in. It talks about the editors. It talks about who's worked on it. Um, but then over on the left, they do have a table of contents, right, where they show you all the different elements. So, you know, like element one, right, are perceivable elements. So they then talk about text alternatives, non-text content, time-based media, and they have it then divided into like this 1.1, 1.2, right, because then we have in the time-based media, they're going to be talking about video, um, audio, 
sign language, et cetera. So that's how it's divided up. So if you click on these things on the side, um, like if I click on guideline 2.1 on keyboard accessible, they tell you what you need to do to make it accessible for a keyboard use. So here they're saying make all functionality available from a keyboard. Right, that is a could be a physical thing that people need um, in terms of going th navigating through content. So then they talk about it in more detail um, there with links out to define the different things. And then they also note other issues. Right, the exception relates to the underlying function, not the input technique. For example, of using handwriting to enter text, the input technique handwriting requires path dependent input. So one of the things I really like about WCAG, if you kind of um, want to learn more about accessibility and online stuff, is that it gives you these examples. So if you're kind of like having trouble uh, thinking through or visualizing how it works, why it matters, um, it does give you examples uh, of that. So here's another example of a guideline. So guideline 2.3 on seizures and physical reactions. Uh, so do not design content in a way that is known to cause seizures or physical reactions. And then they give you examples, right? So if you're using motion animation, um, you can uh, disable it, right? Unless it is essential to the functionality or the information being conveyed. So then they again talk about the problem and then what works well. So problem in the online tax app, as I move my mouse around or tab to different fields, this little bubble with the current balance reminds, follows me around the screen. This makes me dizzy, dizzy and nauseous. And then what works well is that there's an option to turn off the animations. And then they link out to more information. If you're kind of like, no, I want to learn more about understanding um, animation. Okay, so that's WCAG, uh, WCAG 2.1. Um, are there any questions about that before I flow into the next part, which is uh, universal design for learning? Okay, I'm going to take this silence of our, again, small but mighty crew as a, we're good, we're, we're doing it. Um, so. Universal Designing for Learning, otherwise referred to as UDL, is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. So it's a way of looking through your curriculum and making sure that your curriculum is appropriate for all users. But I'm going to talk about it here, and I like talking about it to any librarian, whether you're involved with curriculum or instruction at all, because I, A, love UDL. B, um, I think it's a great approach and it's a great way of thinking about all things, including all things to do with library stuff, including collections, which I'm going to flow into for a sec and after, you know, I go over the basics of UDL. So yes, um, Rachel saying I've spent many hours with the WCAG link checker. Yes, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so yes, um, so universal design for learning, uh, I like it again, it's very clear in how it is because it is universal design for learning. So I like these images that I've pulled from the cast UDL video that's linked throughout this presentation uh, that it's, it's about five minutes. So if you don't really know anything about UDL, I do recommend watching it um, uh, just to kind of get familiar with the basics to think through how it could affect your job. But right, this universal is not just about um, abilities, disabilities. It's also about we learn in different ways. So we have a picture here of, again, all these different kinds of learners and maybe what their different learning preferences are. Uh, we used to say learning styles a lot because people would say, well, I prefer the style of video over text or things like that. But actually, we have found that really what that is is learning preferences and that that is totally fine, too. And we're still trying to hit all those preferences. So um, of course, architecture has proven this a long time ago. And then again, pedagogy and the way we work is kind of catching up or we're still catching up. But if you design a space, a physical space that is accessible for everybody, um, no, no matter what your physical abilities are, then it is better for everyone. Like everyone likes it better, <laughs> you know? So, you know, including people who uh, don't have any kind of physical disabilities. So again, it's the same thing for curriculum. It's the same way we design our presentations. And again, it's the same thing with collections. And then learning, you know, again, beyond the learning preferences, beyond us having different, you know, ways of doing things, ways of learning, we have different brain parts, right, that think through the different parts of how we think about rec how we develop ideas about recognition, skills and strategies, and caring and prioritizing. So ideally, a learning environment 
a curriculum is hitting us in all these different ways. Um, and again, it can be the same to me, it can be said for a collection based as well. So a really huge component of UDL is providing multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. So one example of this could be if you're teaching a class, right? You don't wanna just have um, one kind of reading content, right? Like if you're only giving your uh, students peer reviewed articles, that's not really great in terms of hitting, again, these all these different levels of understanding, levels of, engage, levels of engagement with the content. Uh, so ideally you're providing a variety, right? Maybe you're providing some videos, maybe you're providing a website, maybe you're providing, um, you know, blogs, if that is relevant to your learning outcomes, um, all these different things. And that can go on and on, right? Like if you're engaging your students, you shouldn't only do it through uh, discussion posts within the learning management system. Uh, try to engage them in other ways. Uh, so this is a thing that is flashed a lot when talked about UDL that I also love because I like how it's like the guidelines are kind of like a rubric and you can go through it in this way of kind of thinking through how you could get better uh, in your teaching because that's really what this is talking about. But again, maybe again could apply to other things. Uh, in your presentations, but you look through the different multiple means of engagement, representation, action, and expression. They kind of define it more here at the top, but then they give you um, different levels of access, building, and internalization. They give you goals, but then you can click into one of these, right, when you go out to the website, which is linked on this presentation, and you could say, well, okay, I want to make sure that I'm really hitting multiple means of representation when I think about the offers a ways of customizing the display of information. And they give you specific examples, they give you ways you can be doing that, um, and more. And again, I've seen some presentations in the past where people go through their instruction, kind of using this as a rubric, uh, just see, to make sure that they're hitting all of these different things, and then again, improving from there. So a big part of UDL, when we think about accessibility, when we think about it in relation to um, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion practice, which is something that is at the strategic level, of course, very important to UNCG, to me personally, uh, to the library field in general, um, is equality, equity, and liberation. So when UDL was first discussed, when we first started teaching about UDL and how this kind of accessible design, this universal design is great for everyone, you would talk about it in terms of this graphic over here of equality and um, the differences between equality and, and equity. So equality is this whole idea of like, oh, I'm gonna give people the same, right? Oh, I'm just gonna give them three equal boxes and that should do it. But as this image shows, right? If you give people uh, different uh, backgrounds, abilities, uh, again, learning preference styles, whatever you wanna say there, um, the same box, they're not going to see the game in this metaphor the same way. Whereas if you provide them what they need, right, which could be different, that's equity, right? Because then we're all viewing the same game, right? We're all able to view the game. But way, really how we talk about UDL RAL is that in the ideal world, when we think about our instruction, when we think about presenting, when we think about our collections, um, we're not really even thinking through providing people different boxes to get them to where they need to be. We're ideally actually breaking down the whole wall, right? Because um, social justice truly is taking away any barriers to learning, period. Right, um, whether we're thinking about it in terms of uh, equality or equity is really, to me, like it's not important. And ideally, we're thinking about getting rid of the fence overall. Like, why is the fence there? Do we even need the fence? <laughs> you know, kind of deal. And there's a um, uh, kind of more like blog posts like uh, about this, like the problem with the original graphic and why. Again, we're kind of looking at it through this lens now. If you want to learn more about that. Okay, so now that we've talked about, again, intro to accessibility, um, we've talked about that, we've talked about uh, like the basics, we've talked about UDL um, to kind of think through accessibility. Now we're going to talk about library collections. Any questions before I move on to that? And I see now um, we do have uh, someone from technical services here now, so definitely uh, Participate in the chat or let me know if you have any things. Uh, I was, uh, Anna, I was saying before that uh, I made this in development with technical services years ago and I've expanded upon it. And maybe we'll get an e resources librarian and they can um, join me on this journey as well. So now, okay, we're going to talk about collections now. 
So when we talk about collections, we're a lot of times talking about our relationships to our vendors, where we get our stuff, right? So um, a lot of times we're thinking through how are we making sure that what we purchase as a library, as a university is accessible. So really, again, it's this whole thing with uh, making sure vendors are held accountable for accessibility. So we now um, like vendors um, that we work with for our e-resources to have these publicly viewable accessibility statements um, so that we are kind of putting the responsibility on the vendor, right? Because we as a library are responsible for providing um, equitable services, equitable collections to our patrons, but the vendor is a part of that too, right? Like they have to, they have to make sure their stuff is accessible. We can't fix their stuff once we purchase it. So they have these publicly viewable accessibility statements. I'll show you an example of one of those in a little bit. Um, pro presence of a VPAT. A VPAT is a voluntary product accessibility template where it's built into the contract where the basically the vendor is saying, um, yep, I'm accessible, um, or if I'm not, we're taking these actions to make it better. Um, and then also including accessibility language within the library's on-file license. So the license, the contract that we make with these vendors. And I'm going to go through examples of all of those and talk about um, what we do um, for that. So yes, Anna said, yes, I would love, I would love a partner on this journey. Um, yeah, and a lot of times, like this was a, something that Kate Hill, our former um, e-resources librarian did research on. Um, so this is not an uncommon thing uh, for an e-resources librarian to take on. And again, we would uh, work together on this. Uh, but I am of course using a lot of what I learned from great e-resources librarians all over the country. So a presence of a VPAT is very important. So VPATs again are these voluntary product accessibility templates where basically it's a template that we as a library can hand to a vendor and be like, make sure you're good with all these different accessibility levels, right? Like for this visual impairment, for um, hitting people, uh, providing captioning, providing alt text, um, all these different things we need to make this online content available through WCAD 2.1, which we talked about at the beginning. So here's um, an example here of a VPAT repository. So let's say you want to become an e-resources librarian or you're dealing with these contracts with these vendors, these licenses. Um, this is a repository where you could go and look here and be like, what else is on there? And kind of see what could work for you um, for your own thing. So um, these are vendors that put them on there. So we like it when vendors um, include their VPATs on here. And if people get them um, and you know, they can kind of, uh, it's, you know, a universal VPAT, they add, they have added them on here as well. So you could go down here to ABC Clio, you saw that one. Um, that's a good one. Like here's one from um, Cambridge University Press. I work with them with the Carolina Consortium stuff I do. So they have an accessibility statement and a VPAT. Well, it has been updated since 2016. So, but still, it's something. So if you go to their VPAT, right, um, it's a Word document, you open it up, and it will tell you like, here's all the stuff that we're saying us at CUP are doing great at in terms of being accessible. So they go into the different levels of um, ADA compliance and they uh, say not applicable supports, um, all the different things, um, depending on what their product is and how it uh, works. So again, um, this is a useful kind of uh, thing to look at if you were an e-resources librarian or kind of thinking through a collection and how accessible it is in that way. And again, a lot of the big ones are on there. Um, so like EBSCO says available upon request, contact your rep, but they do have navigation aids. And I'm gonna show you one of their um, publicly available accessibility statements in a little bit. Um, so, but like, so you see a lot of the big ones, they do have VPATs. Um, at this day and age, it's actually kind of uncommon for these big vendors to not have a VPAT. So check that out. So it's actually on VPAT 2.0 now. Um, I think when I made this presentation three years ago, it was just VPAT and now there's a 2.0, which is basically that libraries and vendors, librarians and vendors work together. And they were like, okay, we had these like basic versions of VPATs that vendors were giving us and here's what we like and don't like about them. So librarians kind of handed them back kind of a like, make this better please. And so now we are on VPAT 2.0. So if the uh, you know, vendor is doing really great, right? They'll um, move their uh, VPATs to VPAT 2.0. So here's also an example um, that's a, you know, again, like I said, when I did this in the past, I had to do a lot of screenshots. So here's a screenshot of that page we just went to. 
So here's a publicly viewable accessibility statement from EBSCO that you could go out and look at where they talk about all the different ways they make their products accessible. Um, you have to be careful when you look at these though. I mean, I think EBSCO does a really great job with accessibility, but it's a it's one thing to like make a website saying we care about accessibility. Um, but it's another thing to actually hand us a BPAT, right? Saying all the different things that you do with accessibility, accessibility and how it can, you know, kind of check off the ADA compliance component of our collections. So be careful not to be uh, fooled, I guess I'd say. I mean, it probably happened to me. Um, so these Big Ten e-resources accessibility evaluations uh, came out a couple of years ago, I'm going to say two years ago, where the Big Ten Academic Alliance libraries fund third party accessibility evaluations for select vendor e-resources based upon recommendations from the member libraries and the platforms that the majority of the consortium owns or is considered for purchase. So what they did is they pulled together money and they paid for outside people to look at e-resources um, and tell them how accessible they were. And then they sent the um, reports that they did to the vendors and then showed how the vendors responded, right? Like were vendors like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that we didn't have this, I'll fix it right away. Or were they like, too bad, we don't care. Um, Cause that's all publicly available on this website that you could check out um, through this presentation. Um, so they have the, um, original report, as well as again, if there was a response from the thing. So here it's like Adam Matthew, they did the report in 2018, they sent them a report um, from this outside company that said, okay, here are the issues we see with Adam Matthew that could get you in trouble. And then Adam Matthew responded and you could look at how they responded. Um, it's pretty interesting. And uh, it was a cool project that went on a couple years ago. Um, so here's an example of like the Lexus Nexus Uni High Level Accessibility Evaluation. So again, these outside vendors. So here's what they said. Um, and here's one of the issues they found, right, in Lexus Nexus a couple years ago, where they said, um, your headings are not correctly used to organize content. And then they link to the WCAG, you know, issue, right, in there that we talked about at the beginning, and so on and so on. And they give you these like really detailed, because they're, you know, outside vendor, outside evaluators that were paid, um, they gave you these really detailed um, reports of what the issue was. So hopefully, again, what would happen is LexisNexis would say, oh, okay, and they would uh, turn that into their designers and, and they would fix it. So they could all be fixed by now. So putting an accessibility language within the library's on-file license is also ideal. So here's a link to an article that I found in the Serials Librarian from 2018 uh, by Fernandez. Um, where an example of their um, accessibility language within the file license, which is basically like the contract, I think, that we, we would create with these vendors. Again, I'm not an expert on this. But basically, when you're creating the contract with them, you would send them something like this, where you'd say, vendor X agrees that all services and products provided through this agreement shall be fully accessible to individuals with disabilities and shall comply with all applicable disability accessibility laws, including but not limited to ADA and Section 504. So this, again, helps the library be covered when in terms of if things come up, if there are lawsuits uh, moving forward in terms of we don't control what these vendors do, right? Um, so accessibility language within the library's on-file license, um, if you go to the Lib license model license agreement under high performance obligation, you can learn more about that. So here is an example, a screenshot of that website that you are welcome to check out where you can download these model license agreements and you can adapt them for your own library, which is pretty much what Kate did. Um, when she was here. So um, our former e-resources librarian, Kate, um, sent me her or the way we were doing um, these contracts, file licenses at the time of her being here. But for any license that is negotiated at UNCG, if a clause addressing ADA and WCAG compliance is not in the license, the following language is inserted, right? Where license shall comply with the with ADA. So again, we put the we put it back on the vendor to make sure that we're covered, and also to give them examples like here we say devices such as large print interfaces, text to speech output, refreshable braille displays, voice activated input, so on and so on. Um, another thing that Kate did is said for every new product that the library is considering purchasing, a VPAT will either be found or requested. So again, if they don't have a VPAT, ask for one. Um, and then if they don't have one, that's concerning. Uh, so we do consider VPATs as a part of the process to determine if the product should be acquired or not. 
Okay, so that's really the chunk of the collection stuff. And again, I am not an e-resources e librarian. Um, we should definitely hire one. If anyone watches this recording, please don't think I'm doing that person's job. Uh, we desperately need one. <laughs> this is just what I've learned about collections and accessibility. So as Rachel mentioned in the chat, there's a lot of tools that can help you with accessibility in terms of your content that you're creating online. Because at this point, we are all digital content creators. Um, so I'm not gonna like, you know, really kind of go through all the stuff because I've shown you, right, how ADA compliance works. I've shown you UDL, I've shown you um, WCAG 2.0 if you wanna play around with that. But there are all these tools that you can just kind of throw things into and see how they work with accessibility. So the biggest one is this web AIM wave checker where you can input a URL into a website and it tells you about accessibility issues on your website. This will work on any website, including our catalog, um, including digital collections, including libguides. So anything that you're kind of curious about maybe what's going on and you would want to communicate with the vendor like, oh, I'm seeing that, and I have no idea if this is true or not, but like, you know, I think we're moving away from content DM, right? But you could throw like a content DM collection in there and then you could go back to content DM and say, hey, I've, I've noticed these issues. Like, do you know how I could help resolve them? Um, and it gives you these kind of like reports um, which is very nice. There's also a ton of um, Chrome extensions that you could add to your Chrome browser to help you with um, accessibility to kind of see how things look depending on, you know, again, these learning preferences, learning impairments, learning differences, um, as well as screen readers. Um, it shows you different contrast issues and also how things work on a mobile device. That is a part of accessibility as well, making sure things work on different devices. Um, as well as um, the NVDA screen reader, which is the probably most commonly used free screen reader uh, that shows you what it's like for a user using a screen reader. Um, so someone with a visual impairment online, if you're interested in that. So here's what the web AIM, web AIM checker looks like, web AIM. Uh, so you just throw that web address in here and then here's what our uh, catalog looks like, looks like, and it shows you the issues. Uh, so it shows you how many errors, how many alerts, how many good things are going on, um, and all those different things as well. Uh, here are some different accessibility extensions featured on Chrome. You could just type in accessibility and see what shows up, but you could also uh, type in contrast. You could also type in mobile. Um, they have tons of stuff. So here are some of the resources if you wanted to kind of learn more about these things. So CAS is a website dedicated to expand learning opportunities for individuals through UDL. So it is pretty much the biggest UDL, you know, resource for educators, for librarians. So if you're interested in learning more about UDL, including um, those guidelines that I showed you, that's where that lives. There's also other stuff. Um, web AIM, who makes that um, web content for accessibility, has tons of guides on it too that breaks down accessibility, um, as well as um, these other things. Uh, that are useful. <coughs> so here's the web way at AM things. Um, so just to show you real fast, because we do have time. But um, I do have a link here to accessible presentations, which was a workshop I did, I think Sarah and Anna were there, where I talked about like, how we make our live presentations more accessible. Um, so um, feel free to look at that and uh, think through that. Um, because really what I'm talking about in the first 30 minutes-ish are collections, whereas this is more about like how we present. And it's, you know, it the same things apply for a webcast. Um, so some things to keep in mind, um, the way we did this workshop, if Sarah and Anna remember, is that it was a game. I actually bought candy. Um, wow, remember those days that I could actually give someone candy <laughs> be in a room with someone um, and it not be an awful idea. Um, yeah, so uh, it was great. I'm sure you're all jealous if you weren't there, but um, I, the same stuff, right? We talked about statistics of accessibility. Why does it matter? Um, but then we did go through some different things um, that I will go quickly because, again, we have time um, through right here. So we played a game of true or false where I said, like, oh, presentation fonts need to be at least 20 points to read at the back of the room for viewers with low vision. What do y'all think? True or false? We'll just do a couple of these. 
I won't make you all do all of them. Someone said true. Well, Anna, you already played before. <laughs> it's false because <laughs> it's actually 24 font. Uh, so if you're giving a presentation, and I would say it's the same for a webinar, um, but if you're giving a presentation at a conference, you you know don't know your screen size, 24 font, and then it's also important to use simple, um, what is it, sans serif uh, font that are easy to read. No fancy fonts for these kind of presentations. Um, so it's recommended to use lots of visuals and charts on slides. So this is false. Um, it's recommended to limit the number of multimedia visuals, images, charts, and tables. Um, if you're using a video in a live presentation, uh, you need to turn on the closed captioning. Um, and really it is best practice because it's such a small group of us today, I'm not doing this, but when I do do national presentations, I try to do this, but there are closed captioning on um, Google Slides. So if I turn them on, here I am, you can see my captioning, um, particularly for all these webinars, webcasts we are doing, uh, live captioning is recommended. Uh, even if you don't like it, uh, it's better for, again, uh, more people than it is not for people. So again, turning that on is a simple thing to do. PowerPoint has a similar feature. Zoom also now has a feature where you can turn on captioning live. I have done testing and the Google slide one is the most accurate as you can see as it's happening. Another thing I like about the Google slide captioning is that it forces me to slow down and think through my comments because I have a tendency, as you all know, to talk too quickly. Uh, so it can also help with that and your presentation style. So reading text on a slide is bad. Bad to read that text. This is kind of, again, one of those. Does anyone know? I'm watching the chat. True. False. See, this is a good game. Don't we love it? It's actually false. So though, does, I was I think someone in library school told me this once where they're saying never just read all the text on your slides. It is actually better and you never know the style uh, to actually read through all the text on your slides. Um, and if you think you have too much text, think about your slide design versus not reading your text. Because again, you just don't know your audience in terms of uh, audio, 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 what is it? Uh, visual, audio, et cetera. Um, so, of course, again, an issue I have, speak slowly, pause, um, check in with your audience. These are all things um, that uh, we do recommend in terms of accessibility. Yeah, Jenny's saying I'm questioning everything. Um, sometimes what we're taught is good teaching isn't always accessible is what I have found with all my research on this. So do not use animations when presenting to an audience, true or false, do not use them. Someone said true. I abstained. <laughs> true. Someone said true. Yes, true. Um, because animations are complicated in a lot of ways, as we saw um, when we talked about the WCAG stuff. Um, live presentation, if you have to use them for whatever reason, um, and I'm really thinking of more like STEM presentations, or maybe you need to show like a cell process or something like that. Um, control the speed and describe the animations fully, like describe what is happening while you're playing it. So true or false, using a template or a predefined layout helps with accessibility. Someone said, yeah, it's true. Most people are saying true. Yes, that is true. Because a lot of these layouts um, do include preloaded headers. You have to have a header for each slide for it to be accessible. Um, alt text for images, also appropriate color contrast. So something I have found with Slide Carnival um, and a lot of the other templates out there is that the color contrast thing, if you play around with it to match your um, university colors or something like that, is not always the case. So that color contrast, be careful. You really have to be careful of it being dark against light to be able to be read well um, by everyone. True or false, hyperlinks are never accessible. False, yes, false. 
true, false, false, true. False. Hyperlinks are totally fine um, as long as they are um, destination of the link, right? So I do tiny URLs are fine, um, especially if they have like if it's like go.uncg library, right? Things that you can easily read out loud. Um, the issue is if you have really long um, hyperlinks and you don't like put them with the text, that's bad accessibility because screen readers, right, are going to read. They're going to be like HTTPS, you know, semicolon slash slash, you know, like all of it together, and that is not great uh, for again people who are using screen readers. PowerPoints and Google Slides provide free and built-in tools to help with accessibility, true or false. True. Um, so there's other stuff and we won't go into detail because I know like people don't want to be here forever. Um, but there are tons of tools and apps that uh, you can uh, either hook on or are already within PowerPoint and Google Slides that um, tell you about accessibility. Um, here's an image I like to show. I uh, took it from an ACRL lightning talk about accessible presentation design um, of the, you know, it's one of those like, don't do this <laughs> type of things, um, you know, uh, in there. So uh, I have a link to who did this in the slides, uh, who made this uh, beautiful mess, <laughs> though I do like the cats reading. But the issue with the cats reading, right, are not the cats reading. I love cats. Um, it's that it's blurry. Right. And then again, a lot of times, um, and this is something to keep in mind, um, and it's a popular design, right, like GIFs, um, fun dog photos, all that stuff is fine. Um, if it's decorative, there is a way to mark that. Um, but you know, if you're just putting it in there for funny sake, but it doesn't connect to the content at all, that's very, again, confusing for screen readers. Um, and, uh, you know, people are viewing it later without the context of uh, hearing what you're trying to say. So again, the other stuff is, um, you know, pretty, uh, uh, I feel like straightforward. Let me know if you have any questions, but there's bad contrast in here. Uh, the font's too small, the image is blurry, uh, the images don't match, the colors, right? Like the, the green color, beware of color blindness. Uh, that would just kind of fade in if you're colorblind. Uh, the neon highlights are too bright, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, it's not great. I mean, yes, there are kitties. I do love the kitties. So this lightning talk was um, pretty good, if I remember correctly. So look at this, all my important data. This is also from the same lightning talk at ACRL. Um, and I'll, I'll say their names in a little bit so that it's on the recording. I don't want people to think I'm stealing their slides. Um, it is their slides from this ACRL lightning talk. Um, but see here, you say, look at all my important data. But I can't read any of this. And this is obviously garbage. I, none of this is anything. I like this one, right? Count of Kotai. You know, yes, no, that's a good one. Attendance, attendance. <laughs> so don't do this stuff. Okay, and then the rest y'all can go through, but there's tools that you can um, use in your presentations. Um, uh, the big one for Google Slides, um, the PowerPoint ones are built in. You go to file, info, and check for um, stuff. And then the Google Slides, um, it's something called Grackle Docs. And then you download it and it's an add-on. Um, so then it's called Grackle Slide and you launch it and it tells you about the accessibility of each um, part of your slide. So um, download that. Um, it's pretty challenging um, for a slideshow to be 100% accessible. Um, so just to let you know. Um, so back to the original one, right? Because um, I was on to talk about both. Um, where does OER fit in? Um, when I give this presentation to national librarians, like librarians love OER, they always ask me this, so I added a slide. Um, but of course, OER, open educational resources, the full nature of them in terms of making stuff more available for our students, like, you know, making cost go down for our students is that they should be accessible. If they're not accessible, then it's kind of like defeating the whole purpose of OER. Um, so here's a quote, right? Educators and institutions alike have a legal responsibility to provide accessible educational materials, including OERs. Um, additionally, providing opportunities to create flexible learning experiences for all students in and beyond the immediate course by contributing to a shared knowledge online. 
So here's this website that's linked on there if you all want to look at it later if you're interested in learning more about accessibility and, and OER. I like this website because they not only talk about why OER should be accessible, they talk about the UDL connection to OER, um, and they also give examples of accessible OER that you can look out and see what they do. So just to wrap it up, I mean, I feel like our small group is uh, doing great, so I don't feel like I have to harp write this, but like um, you don't have to do this alone. What? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Rachel did ask a question, um, and this is a question I hear a lot about turning on live captions in Zoom. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that up before. Yeah, so you have to um, do it. I'd have to stop sharing. Let me see if I can do it real fast. Sorry, I have a meeting. Friday and it might be helpful to be able to do it. Maybe it's not turned on yet at UNCG. So for me, um, it's under more. Um, it may just be because I'm the host. Maybe you're maybe only the host can do it because I don't have a more. So I see more and then closed caption and then I have to assign someone to be live captioning it. Oh, so that's live captioning. There is an automatic Zoom caption. Yeah, it's so something I've about, seen done in other webinars, but I Yeah, it gives me this option for use a third party CC service that you then have to copy some kind of token and use it somewhere else, which I don't understand. And UNCG, okay. because we're like an institution level thing, we get updates and then sometimes we have to test them for a while. Um, recordings all do now come with a transcript. That was a change. Remember when we first got Zoom, they didn't. But Google Meet has live captioning that uses the same technology as those Google Slides. And um, I've gotten feedback from students that it's, it's great. So if anyone requests live captioning, I use Google Meets. And you can record Google Meets now. Okay, thank you. Help. So if you if you need captioning or if you want to play around with captioning, I would actually recommend Google Meets. Um, and I'll um, ask about it at the next ITC meeting because I have seen it done in like ACRL webinars. Um, but again, at ACRL, they've made a um, a rule that the Google Slides are better and um, easier. So um, you know they recommend people using the Google Slides and turning on the CC for these um, all these webinars going on for live captioning. Another way to do live captioning in um, webinars uh, is through outside vendors that feed people the transcript on a browser. And one of them is um, Otter AI. It's free if you want to play around with it. it, it it's a transcript creation tool, um, but because it's a transcript tool, right, it reads your text live. Um, so you can drop a link to an Otter AI you know, browser and do it that way as well. I actually was in a conference where they were like, they couldn't get the captioning to work. And so like someone in the audience was like, have you tried this? And on the fly, they did that and created live captioning through um, yeah, Otter AI. So um, that's really it is the OER stuff was the end. Um, and then if y'all have any questions, concerns, want to tell stories about accessibility or other things. <laughs> That's the end of uh, my presentation part anyway. Thank you so much, Sam. So if people have questions, this is a great time to ask them. And before anyone leaves, I am going to paste in the assessment form, which I was slacking on using for quite some time, but I am actually attempting to use now. So I've just pasted in the link to the assessment form. Um, and, and we have the link to Sam's slides. Um, I can put that in again. Wow, we had oh. a lot of chat activity because of the sweet game we played. Yeah, and also, um, I'll, I can throw them back in the slide, but also um, one of my last slides I was gonna show y'all too is that we do have an accessibility, an online accessibility coordinator at UNCG. Her name is Melanie Ely. And I'm dropping her slash the UNCG accessibility website on there. So she has tons of resources on there on how to use the screen readers, how to check your PowerPoints, how to check your Google slides, uh, common issues, videos, webinars. 
um, all kinds of things. There's a whole section on UDL on there. Um, so this was again, more kind of library collection specific, library stuff specific, but if you are you know, interested in web accessibility or online course accessibility, um, you're always welcome to email me, but um, a lot of times I'll loop in Melanie anyway. She's really great with like, again, one-on-one -on -one emails. Like for example, um, Jenny made a video that like didn't have sound, you know? So we were kind of like, well, what do we need to do to caption this? Like, we don't do this a lot. Um, so we wrote her and we're like, what do you, what is the best practice of how we can do this? And she wrote us right back and like made suggestions. And the, the ultimate suggestion for that was a link in the YouTube to a Google doc where we like describe what was going on in the video um, for the captioning. It was very artistic. Yes, it was beautiful. Um, so again, that's just an example of how she's very helpful. Um, and I've met with her multiple times. Um, we're, so I've kind of filled her in on how we work in terms of our collections, you know, to kind of uh, cover her that way. So she doesn't feel like she has to <laughs> monitor our collections for accessibility issues. But she, it's a great resource if you haven't checked that out. Thank you. Hey. Very cool. Any other questions? concerns, anger. Sometimes I do these presentations, people are like, mm, this is so hard. I'm like, sorry. You've got the wrong audience for that. Yeah, y'all are, y'all are getting my mighty crew. All right, folks. Well, it sounds like that's it. Thank you again, Sam. And thank you all for attending. Um, I am going to go ahead and close things out now. I have not yet decided if we will be having a UL VLC session next week because it's a short week. Um, so we may take a break, but we'll be back. Um, and if you're interested, make sure you see Sarah's email with the form about UL VLC lightning rounds. Hi, everyone. Bye, everyone. Beloved Jay. Bye, Jenny. Bye.